Good morning, and welcome to Japan in 2022, co-hosted by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., and the, and the Brookings Institution. I'm Peter Kelly, president of the National Association of Japan America Societies, or NAGIS. NAGIS' role is to strengthen the network of 38 Japan America Societies all around the country by providing programming, Japan-related programming opportunities. In cooperation with funding foundations, we offer series covering public affairs, geostrategy, business, culture, and security. Today's event is part of the Japan Currents series of public affairs presentations taking place at Japan American societies across the country. There'll be 11 of them in different cities. Japan Currents is funded by the Embassy of Japan, and we offer special thanks to the embassy, especially Minister Masashi Mizobuchi and Hiroki Tanaka for their support of this program. Japan in the Year is the Japan America Society of Washington DC's signature public affairs program involving predictions for the coming year. 2022 is already an interesting year and Japan America Society of Washington DC President Ryan Schaefer and Dr. Maria Solis of the Brookings Institution have put together an excellent cast of speakers to think about the year 2022. We look forward to their predictions. To introduce Japan in 2022, here is Japan America Society of Washington DC President, Ryan Schaefer. Ryan. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we're so grateful to NAJAS and the Embassy of Japan for enabling this event for the eighth straight year. Uh, welcome from us to our friends in Washington, D.C., uh, Tokyo, and elsewhere around our countries and beyond, uh, to Japan in 2022, a look at the year ahead. Um, uh, the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. is a nonprofit, nonpartisan membership organization dedicated to supporting the grassroots of the U.S.-Japan relationship in the nation's capital region. As the society enters our 65th year, I'm proud to announce that on April 22nd this year, we will host the 30th anniversary of the Society's National Japan Bowl Japanese Language and Culture Competition, uh, as well as on April 9 and 10, the 60th anniversary of our world famous Sakura Matsuri Japanese Street Festival. Uh, this event is generally the largest Japanese cultural festival in the United States and I think the fact that it happens here in DC is a reflection of the fact that not only is the US-Japan relationship a critically important national asset to both of our countries, uh, but that it is anchored in our tight people-to-people -people relations. This is the eighth year running of the Society's Japan in the Year program, as Peter mentioned. We're uh, very, very excited to be presenting for the first time with Dr. Solis. Uh, and the Brookings Institution this year. And so I'm um, really grateful to you, uh, Dr. Solis, uh, and your colleagues for playing the host role. Um, I'm also grateful and pleased to say that Jim Schof uh, uh, had been our, our host partner for the previous seven years, and he's joining today as a panelist, like an alumni returning triumphantly to campus. Uh, we'll hear from a moment in Dr. Solis, or uh, from Dr. Solis in a moment, uh, who's doing double duty this morning and who will moderate our first section of the event, an armchair discussion between Japan, Japan's ambassador to the United States, His Excellency uh, Tomi Takoji, as well as Charge d'Affaires at the US Embassy in Tokyo, uh, Raymond Green. We're honored to have you both. Uh, following that discussion, we'll have two moderated panels as is the pattern of this program. Uh, first, a discussion of Japan's domestic politics and the economy moderated by Christy Gavella of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, uh, followed by a discussion of Japan's foreign policy and U.S.-Japan relations moderated by Dmitry Sevastopoulo of the Financial Times. We welcome audience participation. Uh, if you have not already submitted a question, you may do so by email to events at brookings.edu and on Twitter using hashtag Japan in 2022. Uh, the event today will conclude at 10.20. Uh, once again, 
So uh, wonderful to have you all with us. And I'd like to give a quick shout out to the Japan America Society of Washington DC members who are joining today. If you're not yet a member, please join us by visiting our website, jaswdc.org. And with that, let me now turn to Dr. Mireya Solis, Director of the Center for East Asia Policy Studies and Philip Knight Chair at the Brookings Institution to moderate our armchair discussion with Ambassador Tomita and Charge Green. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan, for that kind introduction. And it's wonderful to be working with you in hosting uh, this program, Japan in 2022. I want to thank Ambassador Tomita and Charge de Affairs Green for joining us uh, to kickstart this program with an armchair uh, discussion. I think this is a very timely session since it comes after the two plus two meeting earlier this month and uh, with the announcement now that there will be a leaders virtual summit scheduled for uh, later this week. So in looking at the year ahead in the US-Japan Alliance, I would like to start this conversation by focusing on the national security strategy documents that we're expecting each country uh, to release and the opportunities that brings for coordination among uh, the allies. So um, let me start with Ambassador Tomita, if I can. Uh, Japan's national security strategy dates back to 2013. Now we know that the strategic landscape has shifted dramatically since then, and that the government of Japan is planning to revise and modernize this important document later this year. So Ambassador Tomita, I would like to ask you, in your view, what are the most pressing updates that Japan's national security strategy requires? And how will the new strategy document reorient Japan's defense and security policies when it comes to new domains, such as space and cyber, new capabilities, such as um, strike capabilities against uh, um, enemy bases, and overall defense expenditures? Well, thank you very much, Mideya. And first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the organi organizers for having me. This is a very timely event, uh, This not just this being the uh, the, uh, the beginning of the year, but uh, as um, media said, we'll be having uh, the first virtual uh, leaders meeting between Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden. So they'll be talking uh, many of the issues that we'll be talking today. So I, I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussions today. And also, it's, it's, uh, I'm so glad to, to, be, to, to be with uh, my old friend, Ray Green, and I'd just like to mention that, uh, you know, how much our government has been grateful for the, uh, the work, great work he's been doing, uh, holding the fort, as it were, uh, in the absence of Fletcher Ambassador for many months. But, uh, you know, the help is on the way. <laughs> Ram Emanuel will be taking up the post in the next few weeks. So, uh, but anyway, thank you very much for your work. Um, on the uh, the issue of national security strategy, uh, media mentioned. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, this is not uh, the review solely on the national uh, security strategy. I think we'll be also looking at uh, the whole defense program, including procurement programs. So, what is going to happen is a pretty comprehensive. That is the first point I'd like to make, and um, uh, and I'm glad the media mentioned the two to uh, 2013 uh, review because uh, I was DG in North America when this review was uh, taking place. So that was uh, pretty much my baby. <laughs> um, but I think uh, we can point to uh, two um, differences from uh, the time we uh, uh, did the 2013 review. The first, uh, already Amelia mentioned uh, the significant shift uh, in the uh, security outlook in the region. So the first difference will be uh, the new review will have uh, much more sharp, much sharper focus on what's happening in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, we are, um, I think the, uh, the picture we're having in this region is increasingly troubling. So I think uh, how to respond uh, this this situation will be the focus of this, this review. Uh, the second big difference will be, um, you know, 2013 review was a pretty much precursor to the, uh, you know, uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, review 
of the, the whole uh, Japan defense policy, including legislative uh, framework. So 2013 review led to uh, the division of guidelines and then uh, the uh, uh, legislative review undertaken by the Prime Minister Abe. So uh, when we uh, uh, do this review, we'll be working with a much strengthened uh, toolkit, uh, which was a result of the 2016 legislative review. Uh, so I think we are in a uh, much more sort of a stronger position to deal with uh, some of the issues we'll be dealing with. And uh, of course, that doesn't mean that the, the, we, we will uh, we not be doing any discussion uh, in terms of adding new tool to a tool, toolkit. And as you, uh, um, as Medea mentioned, the, whether or not Japan should have a long uh, distance start, starting capability will be uh, one of the issues we'll be uh, talking about. Uh, anyway, um, the, the substance of review, uh, I don't think I should uh, uh, be prejudicial to what is going to happen, but uh, all, the, all the points you media mentioned like cross-domain uh, uh, challenges, uh, interoper question of interoperability, uh, technological cooperation, all these points will be included. And also uh, in terms of uh, defense expenditure, uh, you know, we take the uh, current situation very seriously. So we really haven't wait uh, for the review to start our, our efforts to expand our expenditure. The uh, fiscal 21 budget, including the supplemental budget, is already uh, the, the highest level of expenditure. So um, uh, we have already started uh, 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 the effort in this uh, regard. And also the, uh, the bottom line is this review will lead to strengthened alliance cooperation. And a two plus two um, discussions, I think will inform the debate leading to the, uh, this review. Thank you so much, Ambassador Tomita, for that very comprehensive overview. And then I would like to ask uh, Sharjah Green, um, the Biden administration has attached utmost priority to the Indo-Pacific, noting that it will shape the trajectory of the world in this century. Secretary Blinken sketched some of the components of the Indo-Pacific strategy last month in Jakarta. Uh, in your view, Mr. Green, what are the most difficult challenges in operationalizing this strategy? What role will the alliance with Japan play? And how can we reassure partners and rivals that the United States will remain centrally focused on the Indo-Pacific, given the multitude of challenges elsewhere in the world? And as we gather today, obviously, the situation in Ukraine is very concerning. Great. Well, thanks, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Solis, for moderating the panel and all your work organize organizing tonight's event. Really happy to see Ambassador Tomita virtually, at least. Um, and I know you're talking to Ambassador Emmanuel quite a bit back in Washington, so please convey uh, how much we're all looking forward to having him out in Japan very, very soon. But uh, back to your question, Dr. Solis, I think um, uh, you characterized it well, just how central the Indo-Pacific uh, is to the uh, Biden-Harris administration. You often hear in this region that uh, showing up is 90% of the uh, diplomacy uh, in the Indo-Pacific. And really, the Biden-Harris administration has taken to this heart, this to heart, even despite all of the challenges with COVID. And we've seen the vice president, multiple cabinet secretaries uh, in the region. The president personally has been engaged through APEC and the East Asian Summit, the Quad Leaders Meeting. So they're really uh, putting um, what, what's the most precious uh, resource in Washington, uh, the time of our senior leaders into this effort. And in terms of Japan's role, uh, they're obviously absolutely central to this. And you can see from just the sequencing of our high level engagements in the region, the first foreign leader to go to Washington was Prime Minister Suga uh, to meet with President Biden last April. Uh, the first place that the Secretaries of State and Defense uh, visited overseas were Japan. Uh, and all of this is because we're so such close partners with Japan and our Indo-Pacific engagement. In fact, I think you can uh, argue that a lot of our Indo-Pacific approach is borrowed from Japan's uh, vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific. And so as we um, seek to deepen our ties with the, the broader region, Japan is absolutely critical to every part of that effort. Now, we, we acknowledge there are a lot of challenges. Uh, for example, one of the challenges uh, for our approach is the 
uh, our efforts to um, reinforce ASEAN centrality. And, and ASEAN is a, a really vital uh, partner for us in the region. But obviously, um, ASEAN has its own challenges, for example, dealing with the situation in Burma, uh, and also efforts by some outside countries to try to divide the organization. And so we need to uh, work together uh, with our ASEAN partners to reinforce uh, their role, their central role in the region. Obviously, another really urgent challenge is COVID. Um, COVID's not only impacting the public health of the region, but also just the uh, economic uh, damage it's done is going to take sustained effort for us to even get back to where we were uh, just two years ago. And so um, it's going to be uh, um, a, a, an uphill battle in certain ways, but I think we're very confident that we have momentum going in, in a very clear direction. Now, in terms of the concerns about whether we might get distracted, I think it's... Um, the world has evolved quite a bit in the last couple of years and this dividing an issue into being an Indo-Pacific issue or a European issue is much more um, uh, ambiguous than before. I mean, I think people, you mentioned the Ukraine-Russia situation. I think people in this region are watching that very closely because of the implications for uh, any use of force would have for the broader uh, rules-based order and including on uh, how it would be viewed by players in this part of the world as well. And I think the European Union similarly also sees itself as a key partner in the Indo-Pacific. It's not only the United States that's developed an Indo-Pacific strategy, but the European Union has also come up with its own uh, strategy for the region, very much in alignment with, uh, with our kind of core values and objectives. And I think you see, for example, the situation in Lithuania, where uh, Lithuania is facing uh, very harsh economic coercion by the PRC because of its unofficial engagements to Taiwan, I think was a wake-up call to the European or European counterparts to just uh, what a common uh, challenge we face, uh, not only in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, but also from countries that don't share fundamental values. And of course, Japan is very focused, uh, um, and rightfully so, on uh, recent Russia-China engagements, particularly military exercises around Japan. And so I think uh, it really we're, we're engaged in a global competition. And I think um, uh, people, countries no longer kind of see it's a trade-off between the Pacific or other parts of the world. Um, thank you so much, uh, Cindy Green. That was really uh, fascinating, and especially the point you raised about the interconnections and that we should not just be thinking about isolated, isolated geographical uh, challenges, but the broader uh, connections between these topics. And uh, let, let me move the conversation and talk about China, because it occupies our uh, minds uh, quite so much. I do think that a defining trait of our time is the rise of China and its increasingly assertive and sometimes aggressive behavior. So I would like to ask each one of you to please elaborate on what do you see as the essence of the challenge that China poses to the Indo-Pacific order? What are the opportunities for collaboration? Where are the areas of competition? To what extent Japan and the United States are coordinating a response to um, China's action in the region and beyond? But I also would like if you could be very candid and talk about how the United States and Japan handle some potential differences in their respective China policies. For example, in areas such as economic decoupling or a boycott of the uh, Olympic games. So this time, let me go to, uh, to CDA Green first. Okay, great. Well, thanks so much for the question. And I would just preface my remarks by saying, I don't think there's any two countries in the world that have done more to help China uh, grow economically and also integrate into the international system. And I think both of us uh, feel a sense of disappointment that the PRC has used its position, both in terms of its uh, economic and military power, but also its role in the international system uh, in ways that under, undercuts the order that has helped it so much over the last four decades. So I think in terms of our assessment of the challenge posed by China, I think the US and Japan are in very much alignment. Obviously, in terms of uh, the economic sphere, uh, Chinese, uh, cyber-enabled IPR theft, uh, some of its um, uh, efforts to dominate key, uh, key sectors through non-market means and uh, violation of its WTO commitments, its use of economic coercion, all of these things obviously are very concerning to us and also uh, the kind of our workers and our middle class. Uh, in the international sphere, China's non-transparent investment and lending practices also uh, pose a threat to the sustainable development in, in uh, different parts of the world. On the security side, we've talked a little bit about some of the challenges we're facing already, but obviously the militarization of the South China Sea, some of the provocations around the Senkakus, 
uh, are, are obviously deep concern, not only for the US and Japan, but other countries in the region. And then, of course, on the human rights front, I mean, we're both liberal democracies and we see the uh, repression we see in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong or Tibet as well as the um, efforts to export some of the techno-authoritarian technologies. Um, it's very much of a concern as we're trying to rally democracies and, and promote a, uh, a transparent rule of law based uh, system. So I, I think our assessment's very similar. I think we co coordinate very closely on trying to counter these thread, th thread the trends and also to engage in a productive manner with, with China. And I would say, for example, on the, on the uh, productive engagement side, obviously climate is a, a strong concern for all of us. The US and Japan both see climate as a existential challenge. We don't see any solution to get to getting the world to carbon uh, uh, net zero by 2050 that doesn't include an active role for China as the largest emitter. And so I think we're committed to working diplomatically with China and also to, and to engage them in, in international efforts. In terms of differences, I, I wouldn't say that we have any differences in terms of economic engagement. I don't think either the United States or Japan seeks decoupling from China. I would say both Japan's efforts on economic security and our own efforts in areas like supply chain resilience are meant more to ensure that uh, our trade and, engage and investment relationship with China uh, is, is fair and, and transparent. Uh, what we talk about is we want a small fence, but a very small, but very high fence and to, that protects our core competitive uh, technologies and uh, areas of, of uh, economic strength uh, while allowing normal trade and investment in those non-sensitive areas. Because I, we do fundamentally think the economic engagement with the PRC is benef can be beneficial to, to both sides and, and to our uh, economies. Uh, I would say that maybe the one area of slightly nuanced difference is the uh, use of uh, sanctions on human rights issues. But even there, you see a very vigorous debate in Japan over adopting the sort of legislation that you see in the United States and Europe or Australia and elsewhere uh, to give us some of those tools to try to use um, uh, economic uh, levers to try to improve uh, uh, labor uh, rights or other uh, forms of uh, human rights protection. Thank you very much, Ambassador Tomita. Well, um... I think um, uh, what uh, Ray has said uh, overlaps uh, what uh, I'm trying to say. Um, but uh, Japan has been um, uh, advocate for free and open in China for many years. And uh, this is a vision for peace and stability in the, in the region based on free, open, and rule-based order. And uh, we very much like uh, China to be part of this, this vision but uh, uh, unfortunately, certain aspects of Chinese behavior seem to run counter to this vision. So this is the, uh, uh, the basic uh, problem we, we have uh, with that country. And uh, uh, for this, you know, this, the, the, the aspects I'm talking about pretty much uh, are outlined by, by Ray, uh, you know, aggressive behaviors in uh, both in East China Sea, in South China Sea, um, uh, the examples of coercive economic uh, measures, uh, unfair trading practices, human rights situation, and so on and so forth. Uh, so these are the sources of, of uh, very serious concern for, for Japan and the United States. But that being said, um, you know, the China is different from the uh, Soviet Union uh, during the Cold War. Uh, China is, the, after all, the second largest economy in the world deeply integrated uh, into the global economy. And as, I, as Ray mentioned, uh, China shares a very important responsibility to address global challenges like uh, climate change. Um, so um, I think uh, Tony Blinken, uh, you know, break, broke down the, uh, our engagement uh, with China into three categories, you know, adversarial, competitive, and cooperative. So we need to work on all these uh, uh, aspects. And in terms of, um, you know, Japan-US uh, um, uh, collaboration, you know, since the start of the Suga administration, uh, the Biden administration, I think we've been working on, uh, broadly th speaking at the three fronts. The first is of course, upgrade our responsive and the deterrent capability uh, in the context of our alliance cooperation. The second area is to, uh, uh, to find a synergy in our respective efforts to, to upgrade our, our own uh, resilience and competitiveness. And this will, in, in, of course, include a, uh, more investment in science and technology, 
uh, protecting, uh, uh, you know, sensitive supply chains and so on and so forth. And the third area uh, we've been looking at is to uh, create uh, um, uh, community of countries uh, sharing uh, values and principles. So the, the, the Quad is a typical example that. So we've been working on, on, on all these fronts and uh, our policies are so aligned. Uh, I don't see much differences. Certainly no, no differences that cannot be resolved uh, through the, uh, you know, uh, 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 close conversation, uh, communication. Um, and of course, uh, Japan and the United States are located in a different uh, geographic position. We have a different uh, geopolitical position, economic position, and so on and so forth. But these differences don't necessarily, necessarily lead to differences in policies. I think these differences sometimes allow us to, to work in a complementary manner. Uh, for instance, engaging the, uh, the countries in the regions I think we can uh, play a sort of division of labor, you know, engaging the various countries. So differences can, can uh, have a positive, uh, you know, uh, aspect. So uh, we, 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 if there are any differences, I think we, we have to make the most of these differences. Um, thank you very much to both of you. I think it's really striking the degree of convergence among the allies, uh, you know, shared concepts of the significance of the Indo-Pacific, and then thinking about the China challenge in identifying areas of both competition and cooperation. So um, I think that this um, alignment of views is going to be very significant in how both the United States and Japan address some really pressing uh, regional issues. And what I have in mind, there's a number of issues we could choose from, but I would like to start uh, focusing on the Taiwan uh, Strait. Um, China's pressure on uh, Taiwan is intensifying and there is growing concern that it may resort to force to annex the island at some point in the future. There are heated debates in the United States about the merits of continuing with the policy of a strategic ambiguity and the remarks of former Prime Minister Abe that a Taiwan contingency would be an emergency for Japan and the US-Japan alliance have obviously attracted a lot of attention. So I have a number of questions that I would like to pose to both of you. Uh, what is the best way to preserve peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait? What is required to strengthen deterrence given the growing capabilities and pressure from China? And more broadly, how would a Taiwan contingency test the US-Japan alliance? Um, CDA Green, would you like to offer your views first? Okay, great. Well, thanks for the question. I just begin by saying that the status quo that has emerged over the last four decades in the Taiwan Strait has served all parties, including China, very, very well. But more importantly, it's also been central, absolutely central to peace and security in the broader region. So that's why we have been very concerned by uh, steps we've seen in uh, recent years by Beijing to try to change that status quo, including by using military coercion. And we've expressed this concern at the, at the highest levels. Uh, obviously, last April, when the Prime Minister Suga was in Washington in their joint statement, we talked about the importance of peace and security in the Taiwan Strait. That same language has been used not only in our other bilateral meetings, but you see it in G7 statements or even statements by other countries. And I think it's really important to see countries that share our values and interests uh, repeating um, the importance of peace and security in the Taiwan Strait, because I think it sends a very strong signal that this is not just a localized issue, but rather something that uh, impacts uh, the broader uh, regional and global security architecture. Obviously, the United States is actively fulfilling our commitments under the Taiwan Relations Act to ensure that Taiwan has the ability to defend itself, even in the face of growing PRC capabilities. But I would add that those capabilities are not seen just as a concern by Taiwan. Many of uh, China's neighbors are also feeling similar pressure, um, not only by PRC um, the military mod modernization, but also much more aggressive action. And so given those developments, you see countries around the region trying to enhance their own uh, defense capabilities. Uh, and the US-Japan alliance is no uh, exception. We just had a very, I think, robust two plus two discussion uh, where highlighting our efforts to modernize the US-Japan alliance and then reinforce those uh, deterrent, um, deterrent capabilities. And specifically in some, speci some areas such as uh, investing in key technologies, such as direct energy, directed energy and quantum computing, cross-domain cooperation in fields like space and cyberspace, 
uh, and the joint use of U.S. and Japanese facilities, including in the Southwest Islands chain. I think all of these steps uh, will uh, bring us, bring our alliance uh, into a, a kind of different level, a much higher level, and, and enable us to continue to maintain the peace and security that we've done so successfully over the last six decades. But I would add, it's not just a uh, effort between the United States and Japan. One of our focuses of uh, effort is to network the US-Japan alliance with other like-minded partnerships, so be it Australia or NATO uh, or the Republic of Korea. I think uh, we, we see a, a coalition of like-minded countries coming together to deepen their interoperability to exercises, it's also sending a very uh, stabilizing signal to the region, uh, to other countries in the region, that, it's, um, that we are uh, committed to maintaining regional uh, security and balance and continuing that the uh, the environment that has enabled the region to be so successful over the last six, six days, decades uh, to continue well into the future. Thank you very much. Ambassador Tomita. Well, um, as, as Ray and Line, the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait um, is critically important, um, not just for the security of Japan, but also the stability uh, in the whole whole uh, national society. And so th this is the message we've been repeating uh, in the various uh, statements uh, in recent time, starting from the uh, Prime Minister Suga's visit to, 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 to Washington uh, last year. Um, having said that, you know, this, this very peace and stability in the Strait have been maintained within the certain um, sets of diplomatic principles. And as, as Ray said, I think um, um, these uh, the frameworks or principles uh, um, have served us well uh, in the uh, in the past half century. So uh, um, although they are they are not etched in the stone, but uh, I don't see see any uh, personally. I don't see any immediate reason to to change uh, the this uh, the set of principles. Um, and. Uh, more relevant question to my mind is, of course, we uh, we can be uh, be tough in our public messaging, um, but uh, being tough uh, in in the uh, in these uh, messaging uh, is one thing, but uh, being ready is a completely different matter. So I think uh, what is important is to uh, uh, to examine uh, whether or not we are ready to to any challenges which might undermine. The, uh, the, the, the peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So this is becoming a very important subject, uh, uh, you know, of the conversation uh, between Japan and the United States, and we are trying to deepen this conversation. Thank you, Ambassador Tomita. I think that's a really excellent point. Readiness is going to be central uh, here. So I look forward to learning more about how the United States and Japan are moving forward in developing this uh, readiness for a potential uh, contingency. Now, there's so many issues to cover. This is a very dynamic region, and I would like to shift gears a little bit and also bring up economics and uh, uh, economic integration, which is so central um, uh, to think in thinking about the Indo-Pacific. And there have been very important developments in the past few months, and this will continue uh, on to 2022. And what I have in mind is that the first of this year, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, a very large trade agreement that does include China, entered into force. Japan is also a member. And also the Comprehensive and Progressive TPP is entering a new phase, one of enlargement, with many countries uh, seeking now admission. So my first question goes to Ambassador uh, Tomita. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership does not really restrict China's market distorting policies in some key areas, such as subsidies, um, disciplines of state-owned enterprises, digital protectionism. So uh, in your view, Ambassador, what can Japan do working with the United States to curb these harmful practices? And how do you anticipate Japan will approach the uh, bids for CPTP membership from China and Taiwan? Well, the, the problem of um, market distortion, we, we take this very seriously uh, because it's, it's not just a question of material damage to, to our trade relations, but it, it undermines the, the public confidence uh, in the, uh, you know, 
rule-based open trading system. Uh, so this this is a very serious issue, and uh, we are addressing, try to address these issues accordingly. And we we need to work on um, this problem through every avenue available, multilaterally, multilaterally, and bilaterally. I mean, multilaterally. The WTO will be the, the focus or, or should be a focus of attention. So we try to, uh, 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 you know, deepen our conversation on all the issues you mentioned in WTO. And of course, including the, uh, the reform of the organization itself. And uh, uh, purely laterally, I think we, we, we've been trying to engage other major uh, trading partners, the United States, uh, uh, EU, for instance, we are trying to promote uh, trilateral discussions on the uh, those market uh, distorting measures, and also we we uh, talk with the uh, not just China but all the other relevant parties uh, uh, how to improve the situation. And uh, uh, as far as our RCEP uh, is concerned, as you mentioned, uh, it's not uh, um, uh, the standard of this disagreement is not high as. For instance, CPTPP, but we we do believe this is a very important way to engage China uh, in the regional effort to to promote rule based uh, trade and investment, and uh, we'll make sure uh, we try to make sure uh, in cooperation with our other partners that uh, China will will uh, 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 uphold the uh, the rules and uh, principles uh, enshrined in, in this agreement, and of course. And uh, the other thing is that uh, RCEP is, is uh, supposed to be an evolving process. So we'll be working with other partners to upgrade the, the standard of this, uh, the, uh, the, the provisions uh, included uh, uh, in this agreement. And um, um, as far as TPTPP is concerned, this is a uh, you know, much higher uh, standard agreement and uh, as far as China is concerned, I think we we are closely uh, examining whether or not China is uh, ready to uphold uh, these high high level uh, commitments. And um, uh, as far as Taiwan is concerned, I mean Taiwan is a, a partner sharing the basic values and the principles, and also um, Taiwan plays a very important role. Uh, in, in the regional uh, economy. And also, um, Taiwan has demonstrated that it has been doing their homework very seriously, uh, trying to join this, this application. So uh, we welcome uh, uh, the uh, Taiwan's application and we look forward to working with other partners to process this application. Thank you very much, Ambassador uh, Tomita. Uh, Sergey Green, um, an important development for 2022 will be the release of the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. Uh, we have been told it will not be a traditional trade agreement, but that in some areas it will be more robust because it will incorporate frontier issues such as the digital economy, climate, um, and supply chain resilience. Um, as you are well aware, leadership in Asia really very much depends on having a proactive economic strategy. So thinking about the uh, coming release of an Indo-Pacific economic framework, in your mind, what are the requisite elements that the United States should put on the table in order to have this position of leadership in the region? And going with the spirit of this event, which is about predictions, do you think that there will be a digital agreement in the cards in the coming year? Uh, great, Dr. Solis. Thanks for the uh, question. As you mentioned, in the region, there's high expectations for the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework that, uh, since President Biden announced it last October. Um, and as you mentioned, we're still uh, in the formulation phase. We look forward to seeing a, a more detailed announcement uh, sometime in the near future. But I can say uh, among the goals for the IPF for the, um, the framework will be to establish shared objectives in critical areas such as trade facilitation, digital economy standards, supply chain resiliency, decarbonization and climate change, and clean energy and infrastructure. So I think we have some of the kind of the frameworks, but as you say, um, we're looking to meet the expectations of the region. That's why um, the approach to the to building out the framework included a heavy 
uh, set of consultations. And all of this consultation started in, here in Japan. So last fall, we had back-to-back -back visits by Secretary Raimundo, Secretary of Commerce, Ambassador Tai from the U.S. Trade Representative Office last month. Uh, Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, uh, Jose Fernandez came out. And all of them had a very kind of deep discussions with their counterparts about uh, all of these specific issues, but also how can we make this framework relevant uh, and appealing uh, to the region. And those consultations with Japan are ongoing. I think uh, all of those areas that we're looking at are areas the U.S. and Japan are already cooperating in very closely, uh, not only bilaterally, but working together to advance those objectives in the broader region. So uh, I'm confident we're at the end of the process, we're going to come out with something that will uh, meet the um, expectations of the region, but also uh, some of the needs for some of these, as you mentioned, uh, cutting edge uh, issues that really haven't been addressed uh, previously, but are things like digital economy uh, that are increasingly important, uh, not only to the economies of the, of the region, but also to the livelihood of its people. And so uh, I would just say stay tuned, but uh, I think we're going to land in a good place. Thank you. We're uh, eagerly awaiting uh, for the details of the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, Framework. Um, let me then uh, bring in with a topic that as many uh, as both of you have remarked is really critical at this juncture and, and that is how to respond to the pandemic and the fact that we are now entering, um, uh, it's been two years and we continue to feel intensely the high cost of the pandemic in terms of life lost, in terms of disrupted economies, and uh, in terms of border restrictions. And my first question is to Ambassador uh, Tomita. Uh, last November, Japan had begun a process of limited entry permission for special categories of travelers, but those opportunities were closed because of the Omicron variant. As you're well aware, Ambassador, there are growing concerns that these uh, uh, prolonged restrictions that limit uh, people to people exchanges could come at a very high cost um, to Japan. I recently wrote a piece talking about the search for foreign talent and Japan's digital transformation and how it becomes very difficult. And it's just one aspect of um, uh, these issues. So Ambassador Tomita, can you uh, share the government's current thinking regarding the reopening to uh, foreign uh, travelers? Well, first of all, I, I very much share the frustration you, you uh, <laughs> with you, Mireille. Uh, I'm in a position to, to promote the exchanges between our two countries. So, um, I mean, the past two years has been uh, very, very frustrating for me personally. Um, as for the, um, uh, the border restrictions you mentioned, I think Japan currently uh, enforced the, one of the most strict uh, 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 border measures among G7 countries. And, uh, but uh, we, we are not under any illusion that we could uh, be uh, sort of faultless uh, uh, in the global society. I mean, we can uh, fend off the, the all the, the infection coming from abroad. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, uh, we introduced uh, the, these measures in anticipation uh, of the uh, very strong contagious Omicron uh, uh, vari variant. And uh, uh, the, the current measures uh, are sort of uh, in place so that we can buy time uh, to, uh, uh, to, to upgrade our preparedness for, for this very contagious uh, variant. And, uh, you know, in the past uh, week or so, I think we are starting to see a sort of exponential, um, you know, spike in terms of uh, the, the variant. So the the measures will be um, uh, under review, and uh, but uh, you know there's still there's a still gap between the level of, um, infection uh, between Japan and the other countries. So I think government has decided uh, we uh, we will need to extend the measures for about a month, month or so. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the measures will be under continuous, uh, continued uh, review, uh, watching closely uh, how the uh, things evolve. And also there are, uh, you know, uh, exceptions to these measures. I think we, we uh, um, uh, take a humanitarian aspect of the each um, uh, case into consideration as we uh, uh, consider 
the uh, the uh, specific uh, request for the entry. So there are um, areas where we can uh, access uh, flexibility, uh, but on the whole, I think we 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 need to be uh, uh, vigilant for the time being. That I think the uh, uh, is in the basis of, of the the current thinking of, of my government. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, Sharon J. Green, I want to take um, advantage of your um, experience and expertise on Taiwan, uh, now in Japan and obviously in the United States, uh, because obviously when we think about the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, interest in how different um, uh, governments are responding and what are the trade-offs that they're prepared to live with and where the efficiencies are. So um, could you comment on what you see as some of the differences and perhaps similarities, strengths or weaknesses in the way in which uh, Taiwan, Japan and the United States have responded to the pandemic? Great, yeah, I would say, um, I've, personally, I felt very fortunate to spend most of the pandemic in Taiwan. I can't think of anywhere else in the world where it was more effective in terms of uh, mitigating the effects and protecting its populations, and especially doing it in a way that was uh, did not uh, trample on fundamental uh, freedoms and, and human rights. Uh, so um, I, I, I it was actually in Taiwan, serving in Taiwan during the SARS uh, epidemic about 20 years ago. And I think one of the takeaways was uh, Taiwan learned all of the right lessons for that. And I think the most important lesson Taiwan learned was to get politics out of the picture and put the uh, experts up front. And so I think the, the, the key for them to build the sort of trust and cooperation of the population that has allowed them to, to keep COVID at bay uh, was really based uh, on that principle. And we are very proud to work with Japan together under what we call the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, which is a platform that we created uh, six years ago, initially bilaterally, then Japan joined us later on, that helps Taiwan share its expertise and uh, successes with other countries around the world that wouldn't normally be able to access that information because of Taiwan's exclusion from uh, most international organizations. And uh, what we call the Taiwan Model of COVID Response uh, was uh, a key theme over the last 18 months, uh, sharing different aspects with countries that are were seeking to figure out how you balance kind of the um, the need for economic activity and, so, and personal freedoms with the needs to to combat the pandemic. Uh, but I would say Taiwan, like many uh, countries around the world, we're very uh, thankful to the United States and Japan for everything we did to develop and, dis and also deliver, uh, particularly vaccines and other COVID-related supplies. Uh, Taiwan is a direct beneficiary, as have been countries in Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, uh, to do donations from the United States and Japan, either bilaterally or through COVAX uh, or through other mechanisms. And we continue uh, to co coordinate very, very closely with Japan on how we can uh, help the countries facing really severe uh, outbreaks, particularly related to Omicron. And so uh, I would say um, all of us have a different role to play in terms of the pandemic response. Uh, I was very impressed with Japan's ability to host the Olympics last summer. I was, able to attend some of the, uh, the, the games in a uh, COVID protected manner. Uh, so I think all of us have learned a lot of lessons. I think ahead of the next pandemic, we're gonna be much better prepared just as Taiwan was uh, given its experience with SARS. Uh, but I think really in terms of both the, the research uh, and uh, development strength that the United States brought to it, uh, the ability to mobilize international uh, support for COVID, global COVID response that the United States and Japan together have done together with Taiwan's uh, I think really um, uh, impressive uh, domestic constraints shows that uh, the three of us can actually be really powerful uh, partners. Thank you so much. And we're almost at the end of our time, unfortunately. Uh, there's so much I wanted to talk to you about, but there's some excellent questions from the audience. And if you will allow me, I will uh, post two of them and then uh, ask you for a lightning round, just very short uh, responses. Um, so this question comes from um, Adam Richards, who's president of AR International. And uh, the question is, Ambassador Tomita, what's your view of how the United States, Japan and Korea can work together to secure peace and stability in the region? So trilateral uh, cooperation. And the second question uh, to both of you comes from uh, Hiroaki Nakanishi of the Liberal Democratic uh, Party in Japan. And the question is, how can Japan and the United States incentivize China for further nuclear arms control and disarmament, specifically rebuilding a post INF treaty, facilitating a dialogue and a strategic stability and maritime security in the Indo-Pacific 
including a peaceful solution of the Taiwan Strait? What kind of role can Japan play for these matters? So two very important questions, um, trilateral cooperation, and then the strategic stability in, uh, in view of China's um, growing military capabilities. Um, so I'm um, sorry to give you very limited time, but Ambassador Tomita, if you can offer us uh, some views and then uh, Sharjah Green. Well, uh, <laughs> well, I was ambassador in Korea before coming here. So I, 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 I know too well that I cannot give you a lightning answer to the question, how to improve a trilateral cooperation. Well, trilateral cooperation has to be um, uh, based on the uh, in a good uh, bilateral relations in, uh, between all the parties. And as you know, um, uh, we have had a very uh, um, uh, difficult relations, a uh, political relation with Korea. And we are making a lot of efforts to, to uh, uh, improve um, uh, these relations. Uh, but having said that, I, you know, Japan, both Japan and Korea um, um, uh, try not to uh, allow uh, a bilateral difficulties to, to negatively impact on the uh, trilateral collaboration uh, in the security area, particularly uh, our solidarity in dealing with the uh, challenges posed by North Korea. So, you know, while trying to resolve the bilateral differences, uh, we continue uh, to, to uh, uh, maintain the robust uh, trilateral composition in the security cooperation. Uh, as far as the uh, the arms control uh, um, uh, discussion between the uh, uh, the United States and uh, 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 with China, I think uh, uh, there I think the uh, clearly the United States has to take the lead in 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 our, in, in our efforts to engage China in, in these discussions. But uh, Japan uh, will be uh, offering our insight. Uh, you know, uh, uh, into how uh, we we should go about uh, achieve, uh, trying to achieve this goal, and there will be a very close uh, coordination and conversation between our uh, uh, two countries. Thank you so much, uh, Shaji Green. The last words go to you. Okay, great. Well, I think it's a very uh, important question. Obviously, how we achieve strategic stability with China. Uh, before Ambassador Tomita talked about U.S. Uh, the Biden administration's China policy of having different elements of competition, cooperation, and, and adversarial engagement, I would say there was a fourth corollary we added last fall after Jake Sullivan met with his counterpart, uh, and then President Biden had his uh, a virtual call with President Xi, which is intense diplomacy to uh, ensure we don't have any uh, miscalculations that could lead to kind of a more unfortunate uh, consequences. And so I think we're very, very focused on ensuring kind of short term stability, but the longer term, particularly the arms control uh, efforts. Uh, we are very much um, eager to engage with China on uh, multilateral arms control uh, efforts, just as we have with, with Russia. Um, I think um, this is an area where Japan and the United States can work closely. Prime Minister Kishida has been extremely focused for his own kind of, kind of personal uh, and very heartfelt um, political re uh, reasons on the issue of nuclear disarmament and arms control. And I think uh, Japan can be a, a particularly influential voice uh, in support of our engagement with China, but even more broadly, bringing the international community back um, to uh, the focus on uh, global arms control efforts. And so I do think that's a very um, uh, fruitful area for US-Japan co cooperation going forward. Thank you so much, Ambassador Tomita Sharjah Green for a really fascinating conversation. This has been the best way to kickstart our program today. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Christy Govella, Deputy Director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund, who will moderate the discussion on domestic policy issues. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be moderating this panel on Japanese domestic politics and the economy today. I'm joined by a uh, wonderful lineup of speakers. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Miyako Nakabayashi, who is a professor of international public policy at Waseda University and a former member of the Japanese Diet. Uh, we have Dr. Kei Shimizu, a research assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Pittsburgh. And we have Dr. Eve T. Bergen, a professor of political science and Kon Wakai chair in Japanese research at the University of British Columbia. Thank you all for joining us today. So each of our speakers will be making brief opening remarks about recent developments in Japan's domestic politics and economics. 
Um, first, we'll start off with Dr. Nakabayashi, who will begin by discussing Japan's domestic politics. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited to be on this panel and uh, thank you so much for everyone to be interested in Japanese politics. Uh, fortunately, uh, Japanese diet ordinary session just started this Monday and yesterday, Prime Minister Kishida gave his uh, first policy speech in front of the diet this year. And um, uh, many of you might have already covered what kind of issues he discussed about. But let me uh, give you a very brief um, summary of what's going on here uh, in, I guess, five minutes. Uh, in order to shorten my time, uh, if I can share my slide, it would be nice. Uh, can you see it? Hopefully. Yes, we can see it. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, first, uh, Japanese general election was held in 2021 on the Halloween day. And LDP uh, got uh, a pretty good um, uh, results. And uh, LDP and uh, Kometo uh, jointly uh, received enough seats uh, to, to control the diet. And uh, uh, surprising, um, actually uh, remarks uh, uh, should be um, the Ishin no Kai, uh, that is a, a sort of a reform type of party uh, that got uh, 41 seats, as you can see on the bottom of this uh, uh, slide. And uh, Ishin no Kai was uh, doing so surprisingly well that um, uh, lots of people thought maybe Japanese opposition parties could be uh, reformed. Uh, accordingly, because of that, um, uh, Constitutional Democratic Party uh, actually had to have a new leadership election after that, that uh, would give some um, um, a uh, new picture for Japanese politics. And the support rate of uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida uh, went up. And um, uh, this is uh, from Nikkei uh, poll uh, taken in December. Uh, his support rate was 65%, which is pretty high. And uh, as soon as he took the office, uh, the be at the beginning, it wasn't that high, but it gradually went well. That actually um, show the people how confident he can be. And he's pretty confident, I think, at the moment. And um, uh, according to the uh, poll, uh, of course, 65% said uh, uh, they would support uh, the current administration and smaller number of the people said uh, not they are, uh, they are not supporting. And if you look at, I'm sorry about the, those Japanese characters because I decided to, to put this together uh, right before uh, this um, uh, session. And uh, this is LDP, 43% uh, of uh, Japanese uh, people who answered the poll uh, said uh, uh, they would uh, support LDP and the opposition party, uh, Constitutional uh, Democratic Party had only 10%. And Ishin no Kai, as I mentioned, had more than that. 13% 13, 13 of the people said uh, they would support Ishin no Kai. And there are other uh, people who have no support to any parties. Uh, according to uh, this poll, 38% uh, of Japanese um, uh, expect uh, the Kishida administration to, to deal with um, uh, or give priority to deal with um, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, situation. And 36% thinks uh, economic recovery is important. And 23% says uh, budget uh, um, discipline is important and so on and so forth. And other uh, reforms and um, uh, child support and so on and uh, foreign policy uh, got 22% of, uh, um, well, actually interest of Japanese people. And a uh, huge issue is the upcoming uh, upper house election, which um, 
is going to be held in July this year. Uh, and um, uh, the session, which is called Ordinary Session, started yesterday, uh, would last until uh, June. Uh, and um, uh, right after that, the election is going to be held, which means the current session is mostly for uh, Mr. Kishida to win the upper house election. The reason is if he can win this election, he will have a golden three years. That means he doesn't need to have any elections for uh, uh, the forthcoming uh, three years. In that case, he might be able to uh, implement more difficult policies that he wished to accomplish. And there are lots of small numbers you can see, but I, I may be able to come back. Anyway, uh, LDP has so many seats, but uh, uh, they have to win them again um, to smoothly uh, pass uh, bills uh, in Japanese diet. Um, this is another uh, picture uh, to tell the same thing, but uh, let me skip it. <laughs> So uh, this is a, an important election for uh, uh, Mr. Kishida and uh, upcoming um, policies such as new capitalism that he talked uh, yesterday at his uh, uh, speech. Also, uh, let me stop it. And uh, he also talked about um, uh, uh, COVID-19 issues and uh, foreign policy issues. Um, as well as um, uh, uh, amending the constitution and so on. Uh, those have to be um, somehow to do with the upcoming uh, upper house election. If he loses it, um, may, you may be um, recall uh, Mr. Abe's first uh, administration uh, when he lost the upper house election and um, uh, he lost all sorts of steam and he resigned after the upper house election because of the results. Um, you never know whether uh, Mr. Kishida can win. If the election is held today, maybe he can win. Uh, however, uh, it is um, uh, in July, therefore uh, it is not that easy for him uh, to accomplish all sorts of uh, policy agendas in the 150 days uh, that would uh, be expected to um, have for this ordinary session. Um, therefore, uh, maybe you can discuss lots of things about it, economy, COVID-19, uh, which are uh, extremely important for Mr. Kishida's administration. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with my uh, brief um, a summary of current uh, uh, politics in Japan. Thank you, Dr. Nakabayashi, for that very thorough and concise overview <laughs> of recent Japanese domestic politics. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Shimizu, who will discuss recent developments in Japan's economics and political economy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Christy, and also the organizers for having me uh, this morning, and also my fellow panelists. It's really my honor to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to talk about the domestic economy. There's really no denying that Japan's economy in 2022, just like the rest of the world economy has been and is severely impacted by this COVID pandemic. Everything from the near closure of Japan's borders, which was mentioned in the first panel, uh, to foreign visitors, to supply chain issues have really stifled economic activity in numerous ways. The hospitality industry in particular, I think, including restaurants and hotels, but also all of their smaller business suppliers, such as laundromats and even farmers, have felt the impact of this pandemic related uh, and, and the related policies. That said, I'd like to focus my remarks today on three areas where I see Japan's political economy trying to shake free, not just from pandemic related difficulties, but also uh, from the economic challenges that existed pre-pandemic, including low inflation, low interest rates, low growth, some of it stemming from Japan's declining and aging population. So first up is what uh, Dr. Nakabayashi just mentioned, Prime Minister Kishida's new capitalism. 
The specifics of this program will hopefully be discussed rigorously in this new parliamentary session that just started yesterday. But in its broad outlines domestically, the new capitalism policy framework is supposedly aimed at achieving a virtuous economic cycle through better distribution of the existing fruits of growth. So this is really in contrast to former Prime Minister Abe who focused on the power of markets, Kishida's plan, Prime Minister Kishida's plan appears to be more market intrusive, uh, including plans for higher wages and even a proposal to increase the tax on financial capital gains. In the past several months since he's been in power, uh, Japanese markets have interpreted Prime Minister Kishida's economic plans as being somewhat maybe perhaps market unfriendly. Last fall, there was even a Twitter hashtag labeled the Kishida shock, uh, linking Kishida's comments to a decline in equity prices uh, in the market. But I believe since then, markets by and large have sort of settled into the new prime ministership with less knee-jerk reactions to his comments. That said, with the upper house elections looming the summer in July, Prime Minister Kishida has very little room for error on the economic front and will be aiming for some tangible results to convince voters of his party and his own competency. And so that brings me to my second topic, which is the green economy. Japan under Prime Minister Suga pledged to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, but also again with few specifics. The positive side of this is that the larger goal has been set, that is carbon neutrality by 2050, and there is much room for maneuver maneuverability by both the public and private sectors. So on the public side, last November at the UN Climate Summit in Glasgow, Japan pledged $10 billion in funds to assist Asia along the path to zero carbon emissions. And this should bring a boon to the domestic economy as well as to helping Asia's uh, and Japan's Asian neighbors. And this is actually on top of $60 billion in climate finance that Japan already committed last June, giving a boost to Japan's global standing uh, in environmental leadership. And on the private side, Japan's commitment to carbon neutrality has created incentives for new partnerships. And I just wanna give you one example, which is Amazon, the US corporation, Amazon's corporate power purchase agreement, also known as the PPA with Mitsubishi Corporation to purchase solar power from 450 solar installations throughout the Tokyo and Tohoku areas. And this project is expected to generate 23,000 megawatts of renewable electricity each year uh, once it's phased in. And in the, this is really the first aggregated solar project of this scale to be backed by a corporate PPA in Japan. So this is really big news for the energy sector uh, and Amazon's partnership with Mitsubishi, a major Japanese trading company under a corporate PPA, I believe is really symbolic of the potential for Japan to use environmental goals to also create new economic activity and growth. And lastly, I wanted to comment on the digital transformation or DX as it is often uh, known in Japan and also written up in the media. Japan of course has long been famous for technological capabilities, but recently the fruits of the digital transformation for Japan and its impact on the Japanese economy perhaps have been less visible. But if you peek under the hood, there is real change. First is the burgeoning wave of younger entrepreneurs choosing employment in startups, and not just temporarily or just as a first job, but really as a career. And I think this is a major shift in how people view, younger people especially view the labor market. And second is the emergence of some very successful businesses that began as startups, but have now really matured to be uh, profitable and successful. So this past November, in the span of just one week, I saw two companies go public that really exemplified this trend. They include a company called Buddycom, which is a communications company that digitizes the walkie-talkie, making real-time communication searchable in terms of data and improving efficiency and safety in everything from the airlines industry to construction sites. 
And this company, which is a small startup, has penetrated large Japanese corporations like Japan Railways, Japan Airlines, Komatsu, helping to bring these more traditional corporations into the digital era. And another company is the Institution for a Global Society, which uses artificial intelligence to improve human resource assessment, allocation, and education. This is a major deviation from the reliance on old boy networks or the name of one's alma mater in finding a job for the Japanese labor market. And the digital transformation is also changing Japan's music and entertainment industry. Uh, through blockchain technology and NFTs, you can now purchase NFTs for manga through a digital, digital collectibles platform called Collection. Now, all of these businesses are really creating a digital marketplace that promises to invigorate Japan's economy in the coming years. So in the spirit of sort of predicting what's to come for Japan, uh, I wanted to end my remarks here on a pretty positive note. Yes, the pandemic has taken a toll on Japan's economy, but also yes, Japan's economy has some pretty strong engines propelling it forward. So I look forward to questions, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Shimizu. Uh, finally, Dr. Tibergan will discuss how Japan has addressed the COVID challenge. Thank you, Christy, and um, thank you for having me in the panel. Thank you to Maria Salas, and uh, thank you to fellow panelists. It's wonderful being with you. Minasan uh, ohayou gozaimasu. So my punchline is there is a bit of a paradox with COVID in Japan. That is the overall outcome you know, over the two years, and including now, is actually very good by international comparison. Uh, and Japan's long-term policies in the region, in Asia, through the ADB or JICA, etc., have actually helped build good preparation in many Southeast Asian countries as well. But the public has been very, very sensitive and reactive. Emotions are high, and the trust with government over the period was affected over time. So there is very high reactivity of politics to the COVID uh, numbers. Um, Prime Minister Kishida chose to be different and, and to show more decisiveness with very quick actions on COVID, including increasing hospital beds, but also quite, you know, essentially shutting down the border. Um, it's also part of, uh, you know, his response also includes a, a more compassionate response with the so-called new form of capitalism. Um, the stakes are very high for Kishida-san because the upper house election and his power are really in the balance uh, when it comes to COVID policies. So now I have five more concrete points about COVID. Uh, the first one is that the general outcomes are comparatively good. Uh, the total number of deaths as of now is 18,400 uh, versus 850,000 in the US. The ratio of deaths per million is 146 which compares to 2,555 for the US, that's a 17X ratio, 17 times less deaths per million. Um, in 2020, Japan actually did pretty well and finished with just 28 days, deaths per million, which was similar to most East Asian cases. Japan, however, was hit hard by the winter wave of 2021, early 2021, which is 73 deaths per million by April 1st, and then by the Delta wave, uh, in the summer of 2021, which is, uh, and Japan reached, reached 125 deaths per million by August 25, which was the peak. And then everything stabilized in September, just as there was the shift of prime ministerships. Um, meanwhile, the vaccination rate has progressed at amazing speed uh, over four months. It all happened between June and September. Uh, and during those four months, it went from 4% to 70% for double vaccination rates. Today, Japan is at 79%, which is even higher than Canada, where I am at 78, uh, the US at 62, the EU in the lower 70s. Only Singapore is at 87 and Korea 85 in the region uh, being higher. Uh, booster rates, however, are only 1%. Uh, and so that uh, indicates vulnerability to Omicron. Uh, so that's the first point. Uh, numbers overall are very positive, uh, or at least in comparison to, uh, to most other cases. Um, second point, um, in, in my recent book, The East Asian COVID-19 Paradox, 
I argued that the general East Asian success across the region, which is all across the region in 2020, was linked to two variables, institutional reactivity and social cohesion. On the institution side, uh, one key factor was the creation of centralized government headquarters with broad authority. In Taiwan, it happened on January 20, 2020, Singapore and Korea on January 22nd. Uh, and also the triggering of pandemic response plans, which had been ready, including uh, the immediate production of PPEs, rapid tests and contact tracing in places like Taiwan, Korea and Singapore, as well as quarantine measures. Uh, and then second, uh, you know, there was social cohesion, trust and mask wearing. In comparison to those cases, Japan did its response with less government intervention and less legal authority for the government. Uh, and could not trigger those very, very rapid reactions initially. But the outcomes remain robust. The two core reasons for those good outcomes have been public responsiveness to the general guidelines, the so-called 3C guidelines, and a very effective response in nursing and residential care homes, which was much more effective than, say, in the US or Canada. Um, recently, there is research on a potential X factor, such as green tea or intestinal bacteria, uh, but that's to be continued. Um, my third point is that we come to a paradox, however, is that public attitudes in Japan in response to COVID and in response to government action are strikingly, strikingly uh, uh, critical. Um, there is an interesting Pew survey, uh, Pew being a U.S. institution, from June 23rd last year, um, at the, in response to the question whether there should have been more restriction on public activity, uh, Taiwan says only 15%. Yes, Australia 14%, Singapore 21%, uh, you know, Europe at 40 50%, but Japan 62%. 62% thought there should have been much more government restrictions. That's the highest number in the world. And the second highest is the US with 56%. Um, when asked whether society is more divided than before COVID, the response in the rest of East Asia is rather positive. In Singapore, only 12% think so. Taiwan, 20%. New Zealand, 23%. Australia, 39%. But in Japan, 59% feel that society is more divided and Korea 61%. So those are the two exceptions in the region. Admittedly, the US is at 88%. France, 68, Germany, 77. So Japan is not the one with the most division, but has the most division uh, in Asia. Um, and so there have been political consequences to that mood. The Japanese public reacts very intensely to COVID news. And COVID has a big political impact for both Abe and Suga. And that's how it has motivated Prime Minister Kishida's preemptive behavior. Um, there's probably the biggest correlation between the COVID count and popularity of any leadership uh, in the G7. Uh, fourth, with hindsight, Prime Minister Suga was very unlucky. Uh, the mortality case and vaccine trajectory just was at the wrong spot for him. Uh, the Olympic management was actually very professional, but it affected public trust and emotions. And the timing was just one month too early for him relative to vaccination. Um, between August 4th and September 5th, 2021, the new cases per million were at 100 uh, and then dipped below uh, 100 after September 5th and after October 1st, below 10, and never came back until Omicron. However, the decision for Suga not to, uh, not to contest the, the race was on September 3rd, uh, when the numbers were still high at 133. Um, and then by the election on September 29, everything was falling, and vaccination rate was going up to 70%, um, when well, issue 62% at that point. Um, and so the timing was just so awkward for him. Um, it's also important to remember that 8% of the deaths in Japan happened on the Prime Minister Abe and 88% on the Suga-san. So far, Kishida, only 4%. Finally, my first point, 
is that on Omicron, actually the numbers again are very impressive. Uh, only two countries in Asia have completely flat uh, mortality rates, it's Taiwan and Japan. Between December 7 and January 16, Taiwan has kept 36 uh, deaths per million. Japan is still at 146 deaths per million, completely flat. That contrasts to Korea going up from 78 to 123 and Singapore 141 to 155. However, uh, the new cases per uh, million and the new cases in general are exploding as we speak. Uh, the numbers we just got this morning is that we just reached 32,000 new cases yesterday. Um, that's uh, you know between almost 300 per million. That is much lower than 4,000 new cases in France per million or 2,300 in the US, 2,700 last week in the UK. But it's very sensitive for Japan given that reactivity. One other sensitive point is that there's a connection to US bases in Okinawa and Yamaguchi, Yamaguchi Prefecture, where Omicron has spread faster. That's why we have now a quasi state of emergency in Okinawa. Uh, so in conclusion, in Japan, there has been extreme reactivity and uh, a high sense of eroded trust during the period, especially last summer, during uh, the, the period of increased cases and mortality. Uh, and it has become a prism of focal point or focal point for public opinion. Uh, and of the political understanding of that public opinion. It affects the legitimacy of the regime. We should also add that Kishida-san is on a political tightrope, probably in relation to the rivalry he has with uh, former Prime Minister Abe. Uh, and so he's very vulnerable in general uh, and has to have an extremely strong uh, response on, on, the, on COVID in order to stay as prime minister uh, with the upper house election. Thank you very much. Thank you for that very thorough overview of Japan's COVID response. Um, so now we're going to participate in a brief moderated discussion. We have a little bit of time and we've also collected uh, questions from the audience. Um, so I want to go back to Dr. Nakabayashi. Um, so you already told us, of course, that Japan is anticipating its next upper house election by the end of July. So what do you see is happening in July? What are your predictions? Um, you've already talked a little bit about what the voters care most about, um, but you know, in particular, do you see any potential for the opposition parties to challenge the LDP's influence? And could you speak a little bit more about um, the gain in seats that Ishin Nokai experienced last year? What's driving that? And do you anticipate a similar result in the upper house election? Yes. Um, Ishin Nokai is uh, a, a wild card and um, uh, they may do pretty well, but we never know. They are not uh, well disciplined yet. Therefore, uh, it is very difficult for uh, uh, the people to judge. Also, uh, upper house election uh, has a unique uh, situation for single seat uh, districts. Those are the ones to determine which party uh, would gain more seats. And for that kind of single uh, seat district, uh, Ishinokai is never uh, uh, tested for that, uh, for a, a larger uh, gaining of seats at the, uh, uh, for the upper house election. Uh, currently, when people are asked, um, they would expect uh, um, Constitutional Democratic Party uh, with a very low, I think, support rate. Um, uh, there are 38% of the people who saw the new leadership of uh, the uh, Constitutional Democratic Party uh, think that uh, they can expect something uh, more uh, uh, only for uh, 38% and 52%, more than half, would say that they would not expect anything uh, from that uh, new leadership of uh, um, uh, the Constitutional Democratic Party, which is pretty a difficult situation for the opposition party. Therefore, um, if it goes um, smoothly. I would expect that uh, uh, LDP and Cometo would gain uh, enough seats uh, to get 
more than half of the upper house, uh, which would ensure uh, Prime Minister Kishida's uh, continuous administration and uh, all sorts of agendas not be blocked by the upper house. Um, however, we never know if we recall uh, 2000, um, uh, actually it was seven um, when Prime Minister um, Abe uh, was in charge. Uh, he got lots of scandals afterwards around Golden Week, which is around May. And uh, uh, as, you, as you know, today uh, it's uh, January, therefore May could be a while. And um, uh, uh, that was the reasons, uh, there are lots of reasons, but what was, uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, uh, those scandals really um, gave difficulties to uh, uh, then Prime Minister uh, Abe. Therefore, if there are any scandals, uh, or uh, very bad uh, uh, consequences or hundreding of um, bills that uh, Mr. Kishida wants to pass, um, the support rate could uh, go down. Also, the Omicron uh, variant is uh, a huge risk. Uh, today, um, uh, the number of the uh, uh, spike uh, or infectious uh, rate went uh, continuously uh, went up, and uh, Tokyo is uh, asking to have another type of uh, special uh, regulations for um, uh, people and uh, uh, restaurants and so on. Um, once um, the COVID is controlled well, usually whoever the prime minister is, the support rate goes up. It is really well correlated, uh, very clear. Therefore, if um, Mr. Kishida cannot handle the uh, infection type of situation in, in the hospitals and all sorts of things, then his uh, support rate could go down. Therefore, there are lots of lots of risks. Um, and uh, I expect personally that he uh, might well win the upper house in July. However, uh, there isn't any guarantee for that, uh, thinking of uh, Mr. Abe's experience uh, years that's, ago. Right, that's certainly correct. There's a lot of time between now and July when things could happen. Yes, that's right. Um, but that gives us a good sense of things to watch. And of course, the COVID response seems to be a key part of that equation. Uh, turning to Dr. Shimizu, you talked about Japan's digital transformation. And we have a question from the audience from Michael Nelson, a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, what do you see as the two or three most important deliverables for the new digital ministry that Japan launched in September? Um, that's a really interesting question. I think along with the digital ministry and also the new cabinet position in economic security, along with the new legislation in economic security, these are some economic policies that the administration has put forward to really try to signal to the public that it's really doing something without putting anything really specific under it. And so I think that's one of the reasons why I, we've received this question. Uh, what are some deliverables? And I think there actually are some pretty low hanging fruit uh, that's possible, including the successful implementation of this new digital mind number system, which is sort of similar to the social security system that exists here in the US. It's had a pretty rough start in that uh, registering people for it, getting them the right uh, documentation has all been uh, sort of very um, sort of slow and, and erratic, much like the way that the vaccine implementation was in the beginning. But once it started, it really caught, uh, uh, caught up and, and it sped up. And most people have some kind of registration using the My Number system, except that this system, despite its call for digitization, has not really been utilized. And one potential low-hanging fruit is really tying uh, this system to a digital COVID passport, like much of 
Europe has done or other countries have done to really make economic activity as well as, well as other social activity uh, much more feasible under what potentially is a much longer term sort of living with COVID uh, situation. And so those are some really potentially low hanging fruit that can be utilized by this digital um, ministry that was launched and to really show the public that not only is the administration doing something, uh, but that it's actually effective in fighting that other, you know, the COVID pandemic side that seems to be that the Japanese public appears to be so sensitive about, just like uh, um, Professor Tiburgian and Dr. Nakabashi just mentioned, especially as the upper house election looms in July. This is something that doesn't take a whole lot of time or financing or technology, it's all really already there, um, set in place, local governments are ready to sort of uh, carry it forward. And if all of this could be incorporated in such a way that there is really a national level database that could help uh, uh, to mitigate not just the COVID problem, but all sorts of healthcare problems that are uh, part of Japan's aging and declining demographic issues, this, this could really be be an innovative area for Japan to take advantage of without even relying on, you know, whether it's foreign trade or foreign influence or even opening up its borders. It's something that's completely contained domestically and so very feasible within the, you know, 150 days or so that's um, perhaps not completely implementing it, but at least really showing that there is potential here and a big start. So I would think that that's really some of the most important deliverables for this cabinet, uh, this uh, administration to sort of signify to the public that despite all these new policies that some have criticized as being, um, you know, there's not many specifics, really nebulous, here's some key deliverables that they could go away with. Great, thank you. So we're at our last few minutes now. So I'd like to, of course, ask you the to do the tough task of wrapping up some final thoughts in about a minute or so. But when you do that, it'd be great if you could um, tell us what do you think is the key issue to watch in 2022 in the spirit of prediction. And I'll turn first to Dr. Tiber again. And so if you say COVID, you know, try to give us a sense of which aspect of COVID do you see as the you know most most pressing for Kishida to deal with. Um, but yes. Any final thoughts from our speakers, starting with Dr. Tieper again? Well, the first thing is uh, Prime Minister Kishida has surprised everyone in a way by doing better and being more decisive on certain moves than expected. Uh, and the key issue to watch is indeed COVID because they will be so impactful <laughs> on the upper house election. Uh, and I think uh, it's well, it's both the numbers and ultimately it's all about the numbers, but also the communication around it and, and how ahead of the curve Prime Minister Kishida uh, is. Uh, so those will be the issue. Great, thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Nakabayashi. Thank you very much. I unmuted. it. Well, uh, there are lots of issues, but uh, interestingly, Mr. Kishida's popularity uh, might be coming from that he is not Mr. Abe or uh, those uh, politicians surrounding him, uh, which is surprising because uh, Mr. Abe uh, was uh, supposed to be very popular. Uh, that, that was the reason that he, his administration lasted that long. And um, uh, Mr. Suga succeeded him. However, because of COVID and uh, actually uh, scandals and um, uh, public uh, record distorting, uh, other uh, prime minister's events to be used for his own interest and so on. Um, those scandals actually uh, were remembered by the people and uh, Mr. Kishida was uh, skillfully hunting that um, uh, to appeal that he is not Mr. Kishida or those old timers. Uh, at the same time, uh, his characteristics of uh, handling all sorts of issues uh, will be seen that he can uh, flip flop, <laughs> he can change his course. Uh, some people might think that uh, he's not sticking with his uh, uh, promise or principle. He's flip flopping all the time, but under this COVID era, 
it is interestingly appreciated by the people so far. That was one of the reasons his popularity unexpectedly went up and is still staying uh, so high. Uh, so um, it is whether people would appreciate his flexibility to change his uh, 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 goals and uh, agendas politically uh, so skillfully or not. Uh, so far, he's uh, explaining things much better than Mr. Suga did. And um, uh, his way of uh, handling issues is so far appreciated. Even closing the country for the foreigners would be appreciated if you take the poll. Very, very interesting. It might be um, Mr. Kishida's skill. Uh, uh, we have to wait a little bit to judge that, but uh, his administration is very interesting uh, to, to keep our eye on. So thank you. Yeah, be tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and Dr. Shimizu for the final word. Thank you. Um, as far as the economy is concerned, you, uh, there's no denying it's clearly tied to the COVID policies. And I think I want to echo the other two panelists in saying communication is key here. Some of the economic policies related to redistribution of um, subsidies or um, um, funds that were distributed, especially to needy families or families with children, were bogged down in a lot of debate that got uh, Prime Minister Kishida entangled in uh, these debates that made the public very suspicious about who was actually getting supported by these economic policies. So going forward, um, assuming that there's no huge spike in the pandemic and uh, that the economy stays relatively stable, communication I think is key and especially over the next 150 days, if Prime Minister Kishida could keep the economic policy um, stable and allow the public to feel as though they're confident in his policies and the explanations are sound and convincing, uh, then I think he has a very good chance at uh, his, his, he and his party have a very good chance at their past elections in July. And then he has the opportunity to really implement some economic policies that are in his pocket under the new capitalism uh, framework that could really help steer Japan's economy towards brighter times in the future. Great, thanks to all of you. So it looks like we'll be watching Kishida's communication skills and his ability to navigate COVID as well as all of the other issues on his agenda with the upcoming upper house election in his sights. So um, I want to thank our panelists for joining us today and as well as our audience and the organizers for inviting all of us to be here. Um, I'm going to wrap things up and hand the floor over to Dimitri Sevastopolo, US-China correspondent at the Financial Times to moderate the next panel on Japanese foreign policy. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, as the others have said. Uh, we're going to follow the same format as the previous panel, so let me introduce our panelists. We have Professor Madoka Fukuda from Hosei University in Japan. Uh, we have Jeffrey Hornung, who's a senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. And we have James Shof, who's head of the US-Japan Next Alliance Initiative at Sasakawa uh, USA. Uh, so we're going to jump in straight away. Um, Jeffrey, I'm going to ask you to start if you can talk about uh, Japanese U.S. defense policy for about five minutes. Um, good morning. Thank you, Dimitri. And thank you, um, everyone. This is a really uh, great time to talk about Japan and the U.S.-Japan alliance. Thank you, the host um, uh, hosts, for uh, uh, carrying us. So let me just jump right in. Uh, as Dimitri said, I will provide a quick overview of uh, security issues or defense issues um, and what to look at in the year ahead and uh, offer a couple of questions as well, things to look at. So uh, it helps by setting the ground, the, the sort of the, the foundation here of what is the likely security environment that Japan faces in 2022. And I would say that one notable thing about the Indo-Pacific region and specifically about Northeast Asia is that security trends tend to remain largely the same. And what I mean by this is that Japan it likely can expect similar behavior from its neighbors, China and North Korea throughout the year, whether that be provocations uh, by China against its neighbors or missile tests by North Korea that fly in and above uh, the Sea of Japan. And of course, relations across the Taiwan Strait are going to likely uh, continue to be tense. Now that doesn't mean that things have gotten, that have, have not gotten worse, 
uh, some have argued that it has, but in some ways it also stays the same. For example, if past trends hold true with North Korea, we can likely expect a further ramping up of escalation as we get near the presidential election in South Korea in early March. Now, I would say that if there is one known unknown, it would be Russia. Uh, now, I don't think Japan has to worry about Russia invading Japan, but should Russia invade the Ukraine, it would likely have knock-on effects that could be felt in the region, particularly if Japan supports U.S. or NATO-led efforts to counter it. I don't mean militarily, but diplomatically, economically. Okay, so what are the big security-related decisions or events that are going to happen to Japan uh, this year? Um, the continuing security environment trends that I just uh briefly went over, I think that puts into sharp focus and also lends support for a few security related initiatives that Japan is undertaking in 22, all of which are closely intertwined with one another. Now, for those of you that heard the ambassador's remarks earlier, you will already heard a preview of some of this. Um, given that the overarching document that the government is rewriting this year is Japan's national security strategy. And the other two related defense building uh, buildup documents are the National Defense Program Guidelines, as well as the Medium Term Defense Program. Now quickly, what these documents are and then what to look for, what to think about. Um, the first and only national security strategy was written back in 2013. And this focused primarily on traditional security threats. Now, while the threats that Japan faces have not changed that dramatically, China's provocations have arguably grown worse in subsequent years. And additionally, Japanese officials have become more concerned about threats posed in other domains. It is because of this that it is widely expected that in addition to um, meeting today's traditional security challenges, the revisions of the national security strategy will address strengthening Japan's focus on the domains of space, cyberspace, the electromagnetic spectrum, as well as issues of economic security related to developing critical advanced technologies and establishing supply chains of strategic, for strategic goods. Moving to the National Defense Program Guidelines, this was first created in 1976. It's been revised five times between 1995 and 2018. Now the 2018 iteration, which is the most recent, is like its predecessors in that it was designed to plan out the next decade, but due to changing security conditions, the decision has been made to revise it early. And then finally, the medium term defense program is based on the 10 year national defense program guidelines and it specifies development plans and the necessary expenditures to fund those development plans broken into five year periods with the current plan covering fiscal years 2019 to 2023. And because the NDPG is being revised, so will this. Okay, so a couple of comments on, on these three revisions. First, different from 10 years ago when the national security strategy was made, Japan has a different legal basis upon which it can act when it considers all these revisions. In addition to the 2015 security legislation, um, over the past decade, it has passed a secrecy law. It's strengthened laws and policies when it comes to defense equipment and technology transfers use of ODA, as well as the use of space. And importantly, the allies, the US and Japan, updated their defense guidelines, which helped provide greater clarity in the allies' roles and missions. So unlike last time, Japan now has more legal framework uh, to work with as it does these revisions. Second, by revising these documents, Tokyo is looking to establish a new strategic framework that looks at Japan's security from a whole of government standpoint. And so in doing so, Tokyo will not just focus on traditional security threats, but it's looking to respond to current and emerging threats through all its authorities and all its capabilities. And then finally, revising these documents provides the rationale as well as the direction to increase the defense budget at perhaps a faster pace to help position the self-defense forces to acquire the capabilities necessary to meet the full spectrum of challenges that Japan faces. Now, what it plans to acquire will no doubt be the focus of much attention to the, when these documents are released, as well as how much it's actually devoting per uh, its defense budget per GDP. But it will signal how serious Japan is on meeting the security threats it faces. Okay, so with all that being said, three things to watch for 
um, in 2022. And then I'll wrap up my remarks already. Um, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but I'm just putting three things out there. The first is fleshing out the two plus two statement that was just uh, uh, released a couple of weeks ago. We've seen a trend, and I'm just going to go through a number of things, and what I mean by this, no particular order. Um, we've seen a trend in bilateral statements from the alliance that shows that the alliance is very much regional in scope. The most recent statement continues this trend with discussions on the South China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, the Korean Peninsula, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, ASEAN. Now, having identified all these uh, in the statement, I'm interested in what the Alliance is thinking it can do in 2022 to address challenges in areas that are well outside of Article 5 concerns or Defense of Japan concerns. Another topic um, that's raised in the 2 plus 2 is Japan's growing relationship with other countries, be the Quad countries, um, with Australia in particular, or with key European partners. Moving forward, how are these relationships going to strengthen and what new avenues are being considered? This is particularly important given the inclusion in the two plus two statement that the allies are quote, committed to cooperate with all who share a commitment to respect for freedom, democracy, human rights, rule of law, um, on and on. So there's a, there's a statement that they're going to cooperate, but moving forward, I'm interested in what avenues that they're going to pursue for this. Uh, a third area, um, just interested in how it will be fleshed out, is there is a big emphasis on strengthening information sharing practices between the allies. So moving forward, how will this affect the allies' cooperation in collecting and analyzing data, as well as joint weapon development, especially given the emphasis in the statement on counter space cooperation and joint analysis on counter hypersonic technology? And then finally, there are a number of just uh, short air sentences that are raised in the statement. There's no depth provided to it, but I'm interested in seeing how these are going to be fleshed out moving forward. No particular order. Things like the allies will deter, if necessary, quote, respond to destabilizing activities in the region. Another is a, quote, commitment to increase joint shared use of US and Japanese facilities including efforts to strengthen the self-defense force posture in areas, including its Southwestern islands. Another is progress on evolving alliance roles, missions, and capabilities, as well as planning for contingencies. Um, a, a fourth is realistic training and exercises and flexible deterrent options. And then finally, being able to address evolving security challenges in an ever more integrated manner. So there's a whole host of things that I think is on um, the, for homework for the Alliance, and I'm interested going forward. Last two things, and these are shorter. Um, it, it, syncing up strategic documents between the allies, I think will be a focus in the, in the coming year. Like the activities that Japan's pursuing, the US is set to release its national security strategy. Following from this will be other strategic documents like the National Defense Strategy and the Missile Defense Review. Moving forward, um, just interested in how well these documents will share a similar strategic vision of the security environment, realistic statements on adversary intentions. Will they share similar assessments of what their core interests are, how their interests are changing, and what implication these changes will have for their countries? Um, and obviously, they won't be written in the documents, but there's following from this will be discussions that we can keep a close eye on, things like roles and missions in the alliance, expectations regarding a Taiwan contingency, how to address the strike gap uh, with China. And then finally, last, and then I'll end here, um, a final thing to look for is the whole discussion on enemy base attack capability. Um, because China and North Korea possess missile capabilities able to strike Japan, and these capabilities continue to grow both quantitatively and qualitatively, Japan's security situation is worsening. Um, when you take this into consideration, discussions that began back in the Abe administration continue with the Kishida administration on the need for Japan to consider every option to uh, boost nat the nation's defense, including this, uh, the, you know, the capability to strike enemy bases. Now, acquiring these capabilities are, are without a doubt Japan's sovereign right to make, but given the cost that is involved, 
the infrastructure needed to utilize them, questions on their efficacy and how Japan will use them, and the fact that there is no consensus in the US about Japan possessing these, the way that this debate develops over the, the current year before those strategic documents are released is a matter of interest. Um, I know that was sort of a fire hose approach, but um, I tried to get a lot out there um, and interested in the discussion to follow. Thank you. Sorry, after two years, I still don't know how to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Jeffrey. And now we will go over to Fukuda Sensei to talk about uh, Japan's Taiwan challenge. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thanks to the Brookings Institution for inviting me to this event. My topic today is Japan's Taiwan challenge. I will share my views on Japan's policy changes towards Taiwan last year and predict its course this year. Last year, Japan made a significant shift by becoming more involved, involved in the Taiwan Strait situation due to the Biden administration's policy that asks its allies to jointly deal with China's expansion in the Strait. Since the Biden Suga Summit meeting last April, the Japanese government and Japanese people began to pay more attention to peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and discuss Japan's role in maintaining it. After Prime Minister Kishida took office last October, this tendency has not changed. Although he attaches great importance to dialogue with China, he maintains Japan's stance of committing to peace and stability in the Strait and strengthening its own ability to deter China's military actions. Facing the, challenge, uh, facing the changes above, China is becoming more cautious about Japan's involvement in the Taiwan issue. At this stage, the Chinese government is only repeating verbal warnings against Japan and sending mixed friendly messages. I think this shows China's attempt to win Japan over or to split Japan from the US and other Western countries. So Japan must consider how to deal with China under the new Cold War between the United States and China while strengthening its commitment toward peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Given this trend, I'd like to predict Japan's policies towards China and Taiwan in 2022. I have three points. First, Japan will stand with the United States and other Western democratic countries to deal with military tension in the Taiwan Strait and China's various pressure towards Taiwan. It means that Japan will continue to state the importance of peace and stability of the Strait prepare for a possible military crisis in the alliance with the United States and strengthen its self-defense capability, especially in the Southwest Islands. Second, Japan cannot ignore China's complaints against its commitment towards the defense of Taiwan and cannot give up continuing the dialogue with China. Also, China is Japan's largest trading partner and Japan cannot maintain its security by only strengthening its military forces to deter China. As Prime Minister Kishida has stated several times, it will be necessary for Japanese leaders to continue the dialogue with Chinese leaders to convey Japanese national interests. With the 50th anniversary of the Sino-Japanese normalization, and the Chinese Communist Party's 20th Party Congress in the fall, Chinese leaders will avoid deteriorating relations with Japan and respond to dialogue with Japan. Finally, Japan will deepen its friendship and cooperation with Taiwan by maintaining reasonable relations with China. The Japanese government doesn't need to make great efforts in this regard. In recent years, Japan and Taiwan have developed a bottom-up relationship. 
the 15th anniversary of the Sino-Japanese normalization is also the 50th anniversary of the new relationship between Japan and Taiwan. Private organizations will hold events to commemorate the tides over the last 50 years, further strengthening the friendship between the two societies. In terms of politics and security, such as improving the Global Cooperation and Training Framework, GCTF, cooperation in the non-traditional security field with further, will further develop. These are my views on developing Japan's policies facing the Taiwan challenge. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Kuda sensei And now, uh, last but not least, uh, Jim, is going to talk about Japan's economic security. Over to you, Jim. Thank you very much, Dimitri. It's uh, great to be with you all and great to see Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. continuing on with this, this series in partnership with Brookings. Um, so uh, economic security, of course, is going to be a, a hot topic in 2022 in Japan, just as it is in the United States. But it, it means something different than a, the previous iteration uh, in the 1990s uh, for economic security. In that era, the focus was mostly on uh, private sector, fostering private sector competitiveness in a globalizing world. Uh, for example, uh, candidate Clinton at that time proposed an economic security council uh, for the White House that eventually became the National Economic Council, uh, but all amid a push behind globalization, ratifying NAFTA, normalizing trade relations with China and pushing for China's WTO entry. So we have a very different environment today, economic security has much more of a direct connotation or a connection to national and military security. Uh, as with most things uh, security oriented, there are defensive aspects and offensive aspects. Japan generally refers to these as steps to enhance protection on the one hand for technology, supply chains, etc., uh, which it also calls uh, a push for strategic autonomy. On the other hand, on the offensive side or promotion uh, or what Japan calls strategic indispensability, uh, this includes steps to make Japanese industry more innovative and competitive in the critical technologies uh, for the future uh, via subsidies and international collaboration. So for a few years now, and we'll see more of this in 2022, I think, J Japanese policymakers have been describing current technological advances as allowing for the creation of society 5.0. Uh, characterized by a much more intense integration of cyberspace and physical space in the economy and in daily life. And whatever you call it, a growing number of Japanese officials believe that there are scientific and technological components to Society 5.0, primarily in artificial intelligence, quantum computing, semiconductors, and data flows uh, that could be exploited by China to Japan's disadvantage, unless Japan takes steps to protect certain advancements. And this even gets down to various enabling components uh, like lithium ion batteries or the base materials for semiconductors and batteries. Um, so it, it, Japan feels that it needs to uh, adapt and protect and, and promote accordingly. And they see a consensus forming with the United States and the EU on this protect and promote front, even if the details are far from clear. And they are taking steps to develop a national economic and technology security strategy to address this. Part of this economic security will also be a part of the national security strategy referenced earlier today. And the goal is to improve the government's capacity to intervene as needed, but some of these issues are controversial and uh, very difficult uh, to coordinate uh, with allies. So Prime Minister Kishida named uh, a first ever minister for economic security, Minister Kobayashi. Uh, he's got a special public private advisory panel meeting now to advise on economic security and his administration is drafting legislation. Uh, probably we'll see it by late February uh, or March um, and they will submit it uh, this uh, uh, ordinary session, uh, diet session, and we'll try to pass before the upper house election. That's the plan uh, at least. So what's in this economic security legislation? Um, on the protection side, uh, we, we, we're pretty sure we'll see um, uh, new rules that will allow for secret patents um, and classified patent system and probably a compensation scheme for companies that are not able to then license in a normal open patent uh, way uh, for certain technologies. Uh, deemed exports or otherwise this is the hiring of, of non-Japanese or foreign 
uh, engineers and scientists to work in Japanese private companies. They'll be probably treated slightly differently in terms of um, uh, access and, and, and background uh, investigations. New cybersecurity requirements for critical industries uh, and possibly allowing engineers at non-defense companies in Japan to obtain security clearances from the government. That has not been uh, possible unless they've been working on a, on a defense uh, program uh, up until now. Now, many in the private sector worry that, that some of these measures could make doing business with China more difficult uh, or costly overall, especially when you get into export controls um, uh, over certain technology uh, or investment screening. On the promotion side, there'll be more money for research and development, uh, subsidies for onshoring, um, uh, for example, semiconductor chips and batteries. There's a big subsidy out there to get TSMC uh, to, to build in, uh, in Kumamoto um, and uh, to protect and promote uh, supply chain resiliency. Expanding international collaboration in this area is certainly part of it, but, but with whom and how is, uh, is going to be a big question. And so some worry in Japan uh, that innovators could get cut off uh, from the broader uh, innovation ecosystem in the world, uh, or that commercial technology could get caught up in a militarization uh, of the bureaucracy uh, surrounding uh, some of the what normally had been considered just commercial uh, activity. I think the legislation will pass um, this session. That's my prediction. Um, but the question I have is, will there be a political cost involved? Um, there could be, and actually for that reason, it's possible that the Kichin administration holds back on some of the most controversial uh, uh, sharp uh, elements uh, of that legislation, which will then uh, disappoint some probably in Washington uh, on that front, uh, particularly um, the, uh, the security clearance extension to, to uh, uh, non-defense companies and whether or not the US and Japan can, and the EU can get involved in uh, classified non-defense kind of dual use uh, research and development. Um, we also saw uh, uh, Yomiuri Shimbun reported that allies are talking about a multilateral framework uh, for export controls to curtail the trade of certain dual use items. Uh, this seems like a stretch to me uh, to be able to uh, accomplish that, uh, but we may see uh, some elements, uh, at least in the uh, what uh, uh, DCM Green talked about earlier this morning, building higher fences around a few select things. Uh, there may be uh, some movement on that front. Um, also, you know, it's important to this is it's important to highlight that this is in some conflict with the whole idea of free and open Indo-Pacific. We have RCEP coming into, into being. Japan is trying to promote rules-based open international system. Uh, if the US is, is trying to uh, curtail certain things or force companies, either you're in our ecosystem or you're out, uh, that's uh, a difficult line to walk in Southeast Asia uh, in particular. Uh, how does this fit with Biden's Indo-Pacific economic framework? Rulemaking and standard setting internationally will be a battleground this year. Uh, and we'll see different approaches between Japan and the United States that could cause some tension. But overall, we're gonna to try to harmonize uh, our approaches uh, over the course of the year. That's the big uh, focus. And then within the Alliance, how we manage and coordinate on these policies is extremely complicated. The usual two plus two process doesn't quite uh, cut it. Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor can't build a plant in every country, so there's uh, beggar thy neighbor kind of uh, subsidy uh, bidding going on uh, going forward. And uh, what can they make out of the core partnership that they agreed to uh, last year on this front is uh, something else I'll be watching. So that's, uh, those are my opening remarks. Great, uh, Jim, thank you very much. Um, Fukuda Sensei, let me uh, jump and ask you first a question about uh, public opinion polling in Japan on Taiwan. I'm curious how public opinion has shifted in terms of how the Japanese people think the government should deal with the China challenge when it comes to Taiwan. And then relatedly, you talked about the shift in the Japanese administration on Taiwan. How much of the shift is due to the pressure from the Biden administration? And how much of the shift is due to an actual change in perception in Japan about its own security and the implications of, of Taiwanese security for Japanese security? 
Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, uh, originally, uh, Japanese people's uh, uh, feeling towards uh, Taiwanese society is really good. And more than 70% of Japanese public, public opinion have a good feeling towards Taiwan or Taiwanese people uh, since, since uh, especially since uh, to 2011, uh, the Japanese earthquake, uh, when uh, Taiwanese, many Taiwanese people donate for Japanese um, society. And, but uh, uh, in the area of uh, politics and securities, uh, something, uh, some, some topic is, um, uh, is, uh, was, was seen as a taboo uh, <laughs> uh, for discussing um, between Japan and Taiwan. But I was, uh, last year, I was really surprised that uh, the, uh, surprised at the uh, result of the opinion opinion polls of uh, Nikkei newspaper uh, soon after the uh, Biden Suga meeting. Uh, in the opinion poll, uh, the result shows that uh, showed that uh, uh, about eighty percent of uh, people uh, support uh, the statement uh, between President Biden and Suga. Uh, Fitch, Fitch, Fitch is stating the uh, maintaining uh, maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. And uh, recently, uh, Japanese media uh, often reported uh, the uh, uh, China's uh, military activity around Taiwan, and uh, and. Uh, many uh, people are interested in the situation in the Taiwan Strait uh, for a long time since, uh, since, especially since the Biden's the summit meeting. And, and so do you think, just on the other question, is, uh, is Japan shifting on Taiwan because of the pressure from the Biden administration or does Japan view the security of Taiwan as increasingly important for the security of Japan itself? Mm, I think originally uh, Japanese uh, people uh, have, a, uh, have good feelings towards Taiwan and are very interested in the situation in Taiwan or the relationship between Taiwan and mainland China. But uh, how can I say, uh, the summit meeting between uh, Biden and Suga and the statement at that time is the uh, big, uh, 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 made a uh, uh, big opportunity to um, uh, trigger, to <laughs> trigger to uh, to start uh, such kinds of discussion uh, in the Japanese society. Mm. That's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey, you talked about enemy base attacks and, uh, and, and missile uh, threats. I'm curious whether you think um, Japan can realistically improve its missile defenses, given how China is making you know, significant continued improvement in missile technology, including hypersonics and, and other weapons. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, well, when it comes to, obviously Japan is a, currently has a two-tier ballistic missile defense system, um, and that, that tracks ballistic missiles. Um, obviously, uh, countries like China have a significant arsenal of uh, cruise missiles, and I think what Japan, when Japan did um, fail to move forward on the Aegis Ashore, sort of took a lot of people by surprise here in Washington. Uh, I think there's still hope among some, some quarters that Japan is going to revisit that decision at some point. Um, but, you know, there, there's the active defenses that Japan, um, that Japan has been procuring, but there's also passive defenses. And Japan can do a lot in terms of base hardening, um, you know, 
hardening munition depots, fuel lines, redundancy. There's a lot of areas that I think Japan, if it had um, the political will to put the budget um, behind, there's a lot of areas that it can do to try to make missile attacks on Japan that much more difficult. But I mean, at the, at, at the end of the day, China has a significant arsenal of missiles and Japan is well within range. Um, and so when Japan starts to move forward on this enemy attack, uh, enemy based attack capability discussion, there's going to be um, serious questions on what are Japan's intentions in terms of if it's just striking launchers or launch pads in Japan um, and these launchers are mobile and the US had a very unsuccessful uh, you know, time with this during the Gulf War. Um, what are Japan's intentions? Is it just going to launch at, is it just gonna strike launchers? Is it going to strike and then open a window for something else? Or I, there's a whole host of conversations that are hopefully will follow on to this. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the point that you raise about China's arsenal, that's not going away. That's only going to get worse. But it's not just a Japanese challenge. It's a U.S. challenge, given our forces in the region as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim, I have a question about, um, you talked about kind of economic security and national security. And if you look at the U.S., where there's been a growing focus on technology when it comes to export controls, um, Trump administration started this, uh, Biden administration has continued, ramped it up. Is Japan making a similar shift? And if so, what kind of pushback may there be from industry in Japan about doing this? Yeah, Japan is definitely part of this new legislation would, uh, it's expected to empower uh, METI, the Economy, Trade and Industry Ministry, uh, to have uh, more control over exports of certain technologies, but also certain research um, and who has access to that research. And so, the, the, the view is that the current legislation does not empower the, the government enough to be able to manage and intervene when necessary. Um, so I think there will be some, some step up uh, in, in capacity there, but, but the fear on the private sector side is number one, uh, that they start putting fences up around more things than are necessary. Uh, and uh, we've seen that same pushback here in, in the United States as well, or that there's um, incompatibility between what the US is saying and what Japan is saying, and what the EU is saying. So some Japanese companies have been getting caught in the middle of feuding legislation and, and controls between the United States and China back and forth where they can't comply with both countries' uh, national uh, laws and have to make uh, a, a choice. So uh, Kei Danren, uh, Chairman Tokura has been kind of talking about this a little bit. They've been continuing to promote their uh, uh, Japan-China CEO summit. They just held one in December, they'll, they'll keep pushing on that front. Um, there, there is room to, to, to settle this in the sense that Japan has genuine and Japanese companies have genuine concerns about uh, certain technologies, some that I mentioned earlier, uh, leaking out and, and allies have similar goals in trying to keep as large of an e innovation ecosystem as possible, but making that work uh, uh, in a way where we're, um, confident in sharing of information and who gets let in, you know, the, the visa rules for, for researchers and, uh, and exchanges internationally. Uh, the Quad is, has a whole working group working on this. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of opportunity here and there's grounds for, for, for agreement, but sorting this out is gonna be difficult. And then politically in 2022, the question is, um, can the Kishida administration kind of push the envelope on empowering the government without tipping the scales and, and uh, upsetting, upsetting business. They may pull their punches on that front a little bit, but, uh, but we'll see. So, so if the Kishida government does make progress on this front, what do you think are the prospects for much more integrated coordination, both bilaterally between the US and Japan on export controls, and then multilaterally, for example, with the Netherlands, when it comes to uh, high-end semiconductor chip making equipment made by ASML. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a two minds on this front. Um, as I said, the, the grounds for agreement and, and uh, the consensus is relatively strong. You know, there, there's a little bit of 
competition still going on and everybody wants to make sure uh, a decent amount of, of production and innovation is taking place inside their own country and, and they're putting money behind that. But uh, bilaterally in the US Japan, we have mechanisms to coordinate um, and talk about the investments we're making. Uh, and, and in theory, we could share data and have more test beds on some of these different technologies and we could really advance our, our, our ability. But, but the, the, the Washington cynic in me uh, says, you know, that it's too complicated. Um, there, are, there are too many vested interests and we're going, and Congress has a very strong opinion about all this. So we're gonna end up uh, building fences around more things than, than we should. We're gonna uh, uh, subsidize certain things in competition with, with other allies. So I expect it to be messy and, uh, and there's gonna be some, some disagreements and potential spats among allies uh, on this front. Thank you. Uh, Fukuda Sensei, if I can come back to you in, on uh, Taiwan again. Uh, we have a question from Gary Sands who asks, what are the prospects for direct high level dialogue, even a Taiwan Relations Act between Tokyo and uh, Taipei? Mm. For a long time, uh, the uh, political dialogue between uh, Japan and Taiwan, uh, the lawmakers dialogue uh, uh, worked uh, really well. And, uh, uh, and uh, um, how can I say? And, uh, uh, and the former sometimes former prime ministers uh, also can visit uh, Taiwan and deliver some uh, high level messages uh, from Japanese government to the uh, Taiwanese government. Uh, but I think it is still a little bit difficult to the uh, official high level talks uh, between uh, Japan and China because um, uh, because uh, Japanese government, uh, as I presented, Japanese government uh, or the, the Kishida, uh, Kishida administration uh, also should uh, maintain the dialogue with uh, mainland China. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are going to be out of time in a couple of minutes. So let me just ask you all, all three of you very quickly. Um, what is your prediction for the most significant thing that's going to happen in Japan uh, in the areas that you've been talking about uh, this year? Uh, Jeffrey, why don't we start with you and put you on the spot, apologies. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I, sticking with the same theme, I, I, I think uh, for Japan, the most significant thing will probably be that enemy base attack capability will be included um, in, their, in their national defense program guidelines. And I would also say, I would, I'm thinking that um, Japan might um, go above 1% of GDP defense spending in their normal budget, not supplementary budget, as we saw last year. And it's going to be, it's going to go by with a whimper and nobody's going to complain about it. It's just going to be sort of, you know, normal routine. Become like the US, you mean. Uh, Jim, what's your prediction for 2022? Um, well, the... The big thing in my little world is going to be this economic security legislation, and I think it's going to pass, and I think it's going to make a difference in allowing U.S., EU, Japan to better manage uh, their, their economic security, technology security on this front, although it may not quite live up to all the, the, the expectations. But I'll go out on a hopeful limb here uh, and say the latter half of uh, 2022, we'll see a noticeable improvement in Japan South Korea relations uh, after the elections uh, take place, and we may see a little bit of a, uh, of a, of a renaissance of trilateral cooperation uh, later on this year. All right, thank you. Uh, Fukuda Sensei, what's your prediction for 2022? Okay, okay. Uh, uh, from the view of the Japanese policy towards uh, China and Taiwan, um, for a long time, many observers have uh, leveled Japan's policy uh, preferences towards China uh, as either pro-China or pro-Taiwan. But 
uh, the Kishida administration's uh, policy can't be fully analyzed by such conventional uh, categorization. And Kishida administration will have to choose a hybrid policy that skillfully mixes deterrence and dialogue against China. And then uh, at the same time, the Kishida uh, administration will uh, continue to put in uh, great importance on the uh, maintaining peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. We have to wrap things up. So I would just like to end by thanking all of the panelists for your time this morning and this evening and to hand back to Mireya. So thank you, everyone. Happy New Year. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you very much. I'm back. I was having some difficulty in turning on my camera. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists. What a rich set of discussions. Uh, thank you for your insights. I think it's very clear that 2022 is going to be a very consequential year for Japan, for US-Japan relations and for the Indo-Pacific uh, region. I also want to thank the audience. Um, who stayed on with us. I know it's a long event, especially on Zoom, but I hope that you were as captivated as I was in following these discussions and especially people watching from Asia. We realize this is late at night. And my last thanks goes to uh, Ryan Schaefer, president of the Japan America Society in Washington, DC. It's been wonderful to uh, work together in putting together this program. So I give you the last words for the event. Thank you, Ryan. I think you're muted. Was. Uh, thanks, Dr. Solis. Uh, let me <clears throat> reflect uh, that thanks back to, uh, to you and the Brookings Institution for co-hosting and managing the digital platform, as well as uh, to NAJAS and the Embassy of Japan uh, for helping to enable the Japan in the Year program for its eighth year. Uh, thanks also to Japan America Society of Washington, D.C.'s individual and corporate members for supporting events like these. Um, and uh, again, to the audience. Finally, uh, huge, huge thanks to Jennifer Mason and Laura McGee at Brookings and my colleague Elise Smith uh, for the very, very capable behind the scenes management. With that, uh, happy 22, uh, every, 2022, everybody. I look forward to seeing if your predictions, uh, panelist predictions come true and hope to see you in person soon. And with that, we are adjourned. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.